Well, good afternoon and welcome to 168. We're going to ask you to rise to your feet as we prepare to worship the Lord our God this morning. We're going to open with a song called Your Love Awakens and may the love of the Lord awaken you this glorious day. worshiping our Lord of God as we just declare that we are exactly who God says that we are in this life.
forsaken by you. God, I pray that we know that truth today. Lord, and as we declare that truth that you are the one who calls us child, that you are the one who has chosen us and not forsaken us, God, we also declare another truth that we believe here and that we value here at 168, and that is that you are the God who changes lives. And that's why we pray specifically to you, Lord, because we believe in the power of prayer, but more importantly, we believe in your power and we trust in your character and what you declare, God. And we trust that every battle has been won by you because you are undefeated and that you have never lost a battle. Amen. Hey, we wanna, we, we are a community that we believe in the power of prayer. Actually, one of our values is actually we believe in prayer over self-reliance. And if you actually read that value, it says this is why we pray specifically, because we believe that God is the one who changes lives. And so today, we are continuously grieving, but we wanna name some specific things in our country right now that are going on that we just wanna be a prayerful community that lifts those things up. I mean. Last week, if you're watching any news, like you can look at what's going on in Dallas. And there are many people waking up without their loved ones at home and they're dealing with the aftermath of what happened in Dallas. The same thing yesterday, you can look at many people are waking up in Buffalo, New York right now without loved ones next to them, without loved ones sharing coffee with them, without loved ones in their house. The same loved ones and mothers and grandmothers and fathers that they celebrated their birthdays or they celebrated last week on Mother's Day. And we just know that our country is hurting right now. We know that as a people we are hurting right now. But may we be a community that stands in the face of what is going on and just prays to our God specifically, knowing that he is the one that changes things, knowing that he is the one that changes our perspective, that he is the one that changes our hearts, and he's the one that changes the hearts of man. So I'm going to pray one more time, and then we're going to teach you a new song. It's actually called Never Lost, and it simply talks about how God can do all things, and that he's never lost the battle, he's never failed, and he never will. So bow your heads with me, and then I'm going to teach you the chorus. God, we come to you one more time. God, you are undefeated. God, you fight on our behalf. God, we know that there are people who are lamenting and that they are grieving right now at what happened to their family, how people from their family were just ripped away yesterday because of the sin of the world. 
God, we pray specifically for those families. May you bring them grace and comfort and healing in their time of need and sorrow. But may you also bring them support, God, support like they have never seen before from your people. And may we be your people that step up as ambassadors of heaven to earth. God, we pray for the families in Buffalo. We pray for those families in Dallas. God, we pray for all the other things that are going on in our world right now. God, those battles that are named and that are unnamed, God, we give them to you. We pray specifically for breakthrough. We pray specifically that you would change our perspective to an eternal perspective. And God, that we would give these battles of our minds, of our sinful lives over to you because you are undefeated. Because you've never lost a battle. You can do all things but fail. Amen. So we're going to teach you the chorus of the song. And the words simply say, you can do all things. You can do all things but fail because you've never lost a battle. You've never lost a battle. And I know, I know you never will. And it goes a little bit like this. Just like that verse says, we know that miracles move when you move. God, may we trust in that fact. May we trust in who you are. Because you've never lost. And we believe and we trust that you never will. God, it's in your name that we pray. Amen. You can go ahead and be seated. Just turn and say hi to somebody next to you as you're taking your seat. All right. Welcome back. Well, hey, we we do really believe in the power of prayer here at 16A Community Church. We actually believe that God is the one who changes lives. 
And one of the reasons that we brought that up, yes, there are things going on in the country. And we, our hearts are heavy for those. Our hearts are so heavy for all that is going on in the world right now. If you haven't picked it up, go home. I urge you, read about what happened, what's happening currently in Dallas. Read about what happened in Buffalo. Read about what's going on in our country and let it break you. But allow the Lord to fill you up. Allow the Lord to direct you and where to pray and what to do. But here at 168, we do have a couple of things happening. It does kind of feel weird to talk about what's going on in the summer with all that's going on. But we want to make you aware of some things that are happening this summer. Uh, so our summer calendar is actually official and it is out. We had a couple of fun major things happening this summer, uh, including a fundraiser game night where we will once again raise support for our outreach partners. Last year, you guys donated so much that we supported our outreach partners for 18 months. Amen. 18 months. I say let's go for 24. Let's go for 24. That'll be in July. Uh, we'll also head up the Joliet Slammers game again. If you missed that, the cheese curds were amazing. Running the bases with the kids were amazing. The kids rolling up and down the hill in the dirt was awesome. Uh, but just being together as a community uh, out in an event in a nice 75 degree day at a baseball game was awesome. You don't want to miss that. That'll be August 12th. And then we'll kick off our summer actually on May 29th. We will have a outdoor church service slash picnic. Those are my favorite services, right? Food and fellowship in the Lord. Uh, so May 29th at 11 a.m. at Sunnydale Park in Woodridge. It's actually, if you go out of the strip mall, the street at the end, you turn right and you stroll down. It is the first parking lot right before the Home Depot. It is the park we met in last year for our church picnic. Uh, we're going to meet there again. We will have the grills fired up. We want to encourage you to bring your blankets, your chairs, bring your outdoor games. Once again, I put the challenge out there. I will beat anybody in any outdoor game, anytime, anywhere, any weather. Let's go. Well, that'll be in a couple of weeks, May 29th. Mark your calendars, 11 a.m. It'll be an outdoor service slash picnic. We'll also want to celebrate uh, just our graduates. You know, a lot of people have graduated in this room uh, from high school, from college, with their master's programs, from seminary. We just want to celebrate all that God is doing uh, in their lives, as well as we want to appreciate all of you for all the things that you're doing in the life of this church. And if you believe in what we stand for as a church, our values, our mission statement, there are three ways for you to give here at 168. Uh, you can give online, you can give in person at the silver box over there, or mail a check or money order to the address on the screen. But before Pastor John comes up, we're going to end this style a little differently. We're actually going to, we're going to read the passage of scripture together as Pastor John makes his way up here. You can stay seated uh, to read it, but you can just kind of follow along with me. So we'll read through James. Chapter 5, beginning at verse 7, and it should be on the screen behind me. So it says, be patient, then brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too, be patient and stand firm, because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. And you have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Amen. Hey, it's good to be back. Yeah, uh, maybe you were not um, waiting for me to be back, but it's good to be back nonetheless. Hey, I just want to publicly thank uh, Pastor Carl and his family and the rest of you guys who allowed me to step away for a few weeks as we welcomed our third child, Sophie Hyona Ju. Um, she is a bundle of joy, especially in between the waking hours, but for some reason, and this is how I know sin is real in life, she seems to be awake from the morning hours of 1 a.m. to 6 a.m., right? That's like her favorite hour just to hang out with dad, to hang out with mom. And man, oh man, it's been uh, a little tiring. But hey, if you have kids or uh, if you just stay up late at night watching YouTube, you understand, right? You understand. But uh, hey, today's uh, message title is Patience, Patience in a Netflix World. 
Hey, out of the many different gifts that my wife has, right? She has a lot of gifts, and she's watching online right now, so I have to say that, okay? But she has a lot of gifts. One of the gifts that she has is she's able to actually give birth very quickly, all right? So our first son, our first son, the labor, I mean, the average labor, I mean, we had friends who were like, hey, man, we've been in labor for 48 hours, 72 hours, and I was just thinking to myself, man, I don't have enough Netflix content to watch while she's, like, going through labor. But our first son was about five hours, right? Not bad. Our second one, I parked the car at the hospital parking lot, and I came up, and I almost missed the birth, all right? Our second, literally, I walked in, and the attending was like, hey, your doctor's not going to make it, okay? And then five minutes later, the baby was out. And the third one, let's just say she beat his record as well, all right? So they all come out very, very quickly. But, you know, as you laugh, I was recently having a conversation with somebody who told me that their kids were watching live TV, okay? Netflix generation. They were watching live TV. All of a sudden, the program they were watching, it ended, and the kids just started touching the screen. You know, they're like... And then they started getting flustered and frustrated. And the dad said, hey, what are you doing? And the kids were like, where's the skip ad button, right? How do I skip forward? Because live TV doesn't give you that option. Patience in a Netflix world. You know, my kids, I don't know who taught this to them. Maybe it was us. I don't think it was us. But anytime a commercial comes on, they literally yell commercial and they run away. Right? And then they come back and they say, hey, daddy, is the commercial over? And I was like, I don't know. You tell me. You come back and see. Right? But, and to that generation of kids and to us, if you have your Bibles or your mobile devices, James chapter 5, verse 7, two words it begins with, be patient. Let the gravity of those two words just sit with you for a minute. In the moment right now, in this moment, just be honest before God. In the midst of your financial, relational, spiritual, for some of you, seasonal waiting. In the midst of illness, frustration, is God gently and tenderly saying, be patient. Now, before you get mad and you start thinking, oh God, how can you tell me to be patient in this situation? Whatever your situation might be. This is how I want to navigate the text today. Here are the three ways I want to do it. Number one is, I want to talk about what is the context that James is writing to. Because I think all of us can be very, very patient if we're at Splash World, right, and we're the first in line at the dip and Dots line, and you're just waiting to be patient for this guy to hurry up and scoop your ice cream. That patient is easy. But what is actually the context of patience for James when he writes it in James 5? Second, I want to talk about what does it mean to be patient. We can keep using the word, but what does that actually mean, and what does it not mean, according to James 5? And what is the one promise that you can hold on to as you are patient, according to this text? All right, so what is the context for James' call to be patient? If you have your mobile device or your Bibles, go to James chapter 1, verse 1, right? This is how you kicked off the series with Pastor Carl. In James 1 and 1, it reads, to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. That word scattered appears in Acts chapter 11 again. Because it's reminding us that the Jewish Christians were scattered, the same word, by persecution that broke out with Stephen when he was killed for his faith. And it says they traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch. I don't know if you were here when I made you the promise, but before I left, I said, hey, I'm going to make you a promise. And because I'm a man of my word, I'm going to keep it right now. I said, I'm going to bring you more maps when I come back, right? And so here's a, here's a map for you just to give you a better idea of what we're talking about. Uh, right here you see Palestine, right, you see Jerusalem. So after Stephen was murdered for his faith, persecution happened. Remember, this is the context we're talking about for patience. We're not talking about dip and Dots ice cream. We're talking about persecution of faith. Jerusalem, they scattered to Cyprus, to Antioch, and the area that's in Syria is actually Phoenicia. So there's a scattering of the faithful Christian. And to this, the pastor, their pastor, James, Right. What does he write in James chapter 1, verse 2? Take a look. 
He says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Hey, I just want to tell you right now real quick. I don't show you a map because I love maps. I show you a map because I want to remind you that these were real people in real time dealing with real issues just like you and me. And James writes, be patient. James chapter 1, verse 2 says, Consider pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. What are these many kinds of trials that you even saw through the book of James? All right, and I'm going to put it up for you on the screen right now. See if any of these identify with you. Are you going through a illness, chapter 5, verse 12, whether that be mental or physical or emotional, and you're waiting, you feel like you're waiting? Are you going through a financial challenge, this chapter 1, verse 9, are you going through something where you are wrongfully exploited and you're waiting for justice? I mean, Carl talked about that earlier, right? Even with the shootings that happened. With the exploitation, are you waiting for justice to happen? Well, James talked about that in James chapter 2, verse 6. And those who have been dealt a legal or a situational hand and are looking for reprieve. Now, maybe your waiting doesn't fall under this category, but I guarantee you some of these categories will apply next week or the week after or in the next few years, because Romans 8, as we talked about on Good Friday, the earth is groaning in suffering because we're waiting for Jesus to come back. But note that in James chapter 1, verse 2, he says, face trials of many kinds, because that word many kinds literally translate as varied or diversified. So don't feel left out if those didn't apply. So that's the context. Number two, what does it mean? What does it actually mean to be patient? I, I think there are actually general two, generally two buckets for patience. All right? Look at, the, look at your neighbor and say, two buckets. Hey, that's actually pretty good. All right? Two buckets. Number one, I think it's the everyday things. Right? The everyday things that maybe is causing you to be impatient. And I'll unpack that for you in a minute. The second are the major things. But listen to this. All right? I want you to hear this part. I think ultimately, our attitude in the everyday things generally translates into our patient threshold in the major things. Our attitude, the way that we are patient or impatient in the small things generally translates to the major things happening in life. What do I mean? So there was a poll uh, just a few years ago that came out. It, it surveyed 2,000 British people on the threshold of patience, right? And I don't feel too bad using these illustrations because it's British people, all right? British people and their threshold for patience, but this is what they said. Those surveys said that, that British people become frustrated if it takes, and I was like, wow, they're actually, their threshold is pretty high. They get frustrated if it takes 16 seconds for a web page to load. When's the last time you waited 16 seconds for a web page to load? I had to repent after reading that. Right? I'm like four seconds in, and I'm like, I need a new phone, you know? What about this one? 25 seconds for a traffic light to change. Oh, I got a lot of ums for that one, all right? 20 seconds to wait for ink to dry on a greeting card. But I mean, this one I love, since it was from Brit Britain. 28 seconds for the afternoon kettle to boil for afternoon tea. Right? 28 seconds. Hey, do you identify? Do you hate waiting for the small things? But what about the tough situations in your life? In James chapter 5, I think is getting at a presumption, an underlying presumption that we have when it comes to patience. And I really do hope you hear this part because we've been taught through our media, through our devices, through the advertisements that we should not only wait less than two seconds for a web page to load, but that we've been taught, watch this, that we deserve quick, fast, painless results that produce the maximum amount of pleasure in the shortest amount of time possible. 
You and I, and I say you and I, we've been trained and conditioned. And we believe, we presume that we deserve quick, fast, painless results that produce the maximum of amount of pleasure in the shortest amount of time possible. And when that doesn't happen, when relationships, finances, season, dreams, goals, when, listen to this, when healing takes longer than expected, frustration grows and bitterness takes root. Why? This is my first point. Because presumption is the seed of bitterness. Presumption means something that you suppose should be the case. And when it doesn't go that way, we get bitter. Take a look at James chapter 5, verse 11. It actually gives you a completely different Christian worldview. James chapter 5, 11 says something radical to what we hear, see, are told through podcasts, through entertainment, through advertisements. 5, 11 says, we count as, hey, read that word back to me. What does it say? Come on. We count as blessed those who are waiting. When's the last time you, you said, man, I feel so blessed that I get to wait? Man, I just feel, I just feel God's love. I feel so blessed that he's making me wait. Because for us, blessing is a subjective emotional reaction, isn't it? I say this all the time. I feel so blessed that I got fill in the blank. I feel so blessed that I am healthy. It's a subjective, emotional reaction. But in James 5.11, it says that it's an objective, unalterable approval and reward of knowing how much God loves you, how much he is for you, how he is with you in your waiting, in your patience. But remember, the Christian view actually goes a bit further and says in James 1, consider pure joy as you wait. Now, here's the first objection that you might have. You might be thinking, John, but what if you're living in poverty and you can't even pay for groceries or bills? You can't pay for food. Are, are you saying, is James 5 saying you should just wait? That we should just starve? We're going to get to that through Psalm 82, and the answer is obviously no, because loving the poor and coming alongside them as Christians is one of the consistent mandates that God provides. But God's not talking about that. Here's objection number two. Are you saying, John, that if I'm in a toxic situation, an abusive relationship, that we should just wait and endure for God? Look at Psalm 82, verses 3 to 4. Here's it on the screen for you. All right, it says, defend the weak and the fatherless. Uphold the cause of the poor and the oppressed. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. This is not talking about waiting in abuse, waiting in toxic situations. It's not talking about waiting in poverty. It's talking about in your daily grind of life. When things are not going the way that you presume that they should, do we wait? Take a look at verse 7, though, of chapter 5. What else does it mean to be patient? Patient means, look at verse 7, that you're a farmer. A farmer, I'm not a farmer. I'm actually kind of the furthest from a farmer. You know, about six months ago, I told you that I uh, planted some snake plants outside, not knowing that they were inside plants, and uh, they are now all dead, right? I remember my neighbor was walking by while I was planting these snake plants outside, and she seemed very engaged, right, very interested in what I was doing, and I thought, wow, I am a great gardener. I'm pretty sure she was thinking, look at this idiot. He's planting these snake things outside, and they're all going to die, and they did. But look at Romans chapter 5, verse 7. What does it mean to be patient? It says, be patient just as a farmer waits for the Lord. You know what a farmer does? I don't. Tills the soil, right? 
weeds the soil. He readies the soil. She gathers the seed. She plants the seed. It's engaging, hard, strategic, sacrificing your immediate need to pleasure, waiting for the next season while you do the work. It doesn't say, hey, while you wait on God, just do nothing. I think there's actually a toxic form of Christianity that tells you, hey, what you should do is you should come before God and you should pray. You should pray for breakthrough. You should pray for God to do something great in your life. That's all good. But James 5, 7 says, hey, while you're patient, while you're waiting, you wait like a farmer. You till the soil, man. You go to work. You do the work. You do everything that you can as you wait for God, take a look at verse 7 and verse 8, to bring the rain. You and I do not control the rain. The farmer does not control the rain. God does. He says, you do everything that you can in your power, and you wait for God to bless it, to bring the autumn and the spring rain. What does it mean to be patient? It means you do the hard work. Take a look. There's actually a word for it, and it occurs six times in verses 7, 8, 10, and 11. And it's talking about this determined perseverance. All right? Twice in verse 7, it says, wait for the land. You see that in verse 7? Then it says, patiently waiting for the rain. That's determined perseverance. In verse 8, you to be patient and stand firm. In verse 10, as an example of patience in suffering. You see a theme? Verse 11, we count as blessed those who have persevered or waited in determined patience as Job's perseverance. Hey, this, can I see your eyes for a minute? This is what I want you to know, all right? I actually want you to know that in this text in James 5, when it talks about this determined patience or patience or perseverance or waiting, there are actually two different root words of patience happening in the original. Okay? One is actually talking about this determined patience. This grinding of the teeth of the farmer going early in the morning until late at night and putting in the work. Determined perseverance, like you see in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, where it says, we boast about your determined perseverance in the face of trial. All right? There's a determined perseverance that happens. But you know what the second, second definition of patience is in this text? It's not a determined perseverance. It's not a determined patience. It's actually a more elusive attribute of patience. It's the loving attitude you carry while you are patient. There's a grinding of the teeth, patience, and then there's a loving attitude while you wait, patience, that are both in the text. Hey, you might be a grinder, but your heart might not be in the right. You might be grinding it out, working really hard. But it's like walking around you, it's like walking around pins and needles. First Corinthians chapter 13, 4, you can write that down. First Corinthians chapter 13, 4, it literally just reads, and you know this, you might know this, if you grew up in a Christian household, it says, love is patience. Hey, can I, just be, um, can I just be honest for a minute? I feel like we're honest all the time, but let me just be honest and vulnerable for a minute here uh, just about my life. Uh, 2020 and 2021 were one of the hardest years, one of the hardest seasons in my life. Uh, after we said yes to God to plant a church, uh, we were walking away, and I was the only one who was working at that time, right? So my wife wasn't working. So we walked away from an income. I'm telling you, we went to zero dollars, right? We went to zero dollars the next month. We walked away from insurance. We walked away from retirement, funding, or any financial security in the future when we said yes to planning a church. Evan, our second, was born on July 7th of 2020. Our insurance expired on July 14th, seven days later. And so here I am trying to scramble to figure out how we're going to do medical bills and medical coverage during the gap time where we're not going to have insurance, when we're not going to have an income, while I'm trying to fundraise in the middle of a pandemic, trying to plant this church. 
at one point, this is how bad it got. Um, you know, I saw a friend, and, and she's like, man, you lost a lot of weight. And I was like, yeah, I look good, don't I? She's like, no, you look sickly. <laughs> you look like, because at one point, I almost lost 20 pounds during the course of six months because I was just stressed. I was frustrated. And I was just trying to figure out what God was up to in that moment. But I was working, man, day and night. Put the kids to bed, back on Zoom calls, trying to fundraise, to raise money, support we need. Day and night. You know that second part? Lovingly patient. My wife came up to me and she goes, John, I, I just need to tell you, you've been working really hard, but the past six months, the past year, it's literally it's walking on pins and needles around you. You're persevering, but you're agitated. You're stressed, and it's coming off on me and the kids. James 5 has two different types of patience. I'm willing to bet that many of you, you're grinders. You work hard. You put in the work. What about the second one, though? Love is patient. First thing we try to do is work through the context of what James is writing to about patience. Number two is, what is it? If you have your mobile devices or your Bibles, you look at James chapter 5, verse 9. It says, grumbling, right? Grumblers. That was me. Maybe that's you. So what is patience? Uh, I think there's at least four different categories of patience that we see in James chapter 5. I'll put it up on the screen for you here. Number one is that patience is, and patience means, choosing patience over presumption. Right? We talked about that. Number two, it's subjective emotional feeling, and it's an objective, unalterable Love of God, that can't be shaken. And patience also is a determined attitude and a loving attitude. All right, we're going to round it out. What is the one promise that you can hold on to as you are patient? If you have your devices or Bibles, go to verse 10. What is one promise that you can hold on to as you're patient? Look at verse 10. It says the prophet mentioned here. You see that phrase there? That's coming from Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 32. All right? Can you turn there for me? Scroll there for me. Hebrews chapter 11, uh, verses 32. We're going to read a bit of it. So go ahead and turn there. And we're going to read 11, 32, and on. And I want you to see something here. When, and if you're a follower of Jesus, if you're a believer in Jesus... Right? This is, these are talking about people of faith. Uh, a lot of times in Christian circles, you say these are the Christian heroes of faith, right? Those who did it right, who stood with God, who persevered, who waited on him, right? And what we're going to read now is some examples of that, and then we're going to see how it turned out for them. All right? Hebrews chapter 11, and then we're going to take a look at that promise, and we're going to sum it all up. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 32, look at this. What more shall I say? I do not have time to tell, tell you about Gideon, heroes of faith, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, about David, Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith, watch this, they waited on the Lord, right? Who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouth of lions. They waited on God, and they shut the mouth of lions. I mean, that's pretty awesome. Verse 34, quench the fury of the flames, escape the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned into strength. That's what I want. Who became powerful in battle, routed foreign armies. Verse 35, women who received back their dead, raised to life again. Here's the turn. Man, and if, you, if I lost you for a minute, hone, hone back in right now. Here's the turn, all right, if you're a believer in Jesus. That front end, we love that front end. Shut the mouth of lions. 
Turn my weakness into strength? Come on. Look at verse 35. There were others, heroes of faith, who were tortured, refusing to be released by choice so that they might gain an even better resurrection. You know what that means? That means they knew somebody that was better than the torture they were willing to accept. And James 5 is going to tell you that his name is Jesus. 36. Some faced jeers. Heroes of faith. Flogging, chains, imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. As they waited on the Lord, they were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskin and goatskin, destitute, persecuted, mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and holes in the ground. This is the term, 39. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. What's being promised? Since God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. Verse 2, chapter 12, ready? Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. You think he waited? Scorning its shame, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him. Don't grow weary. Don't lose heart. Okay, go back to James chapter 5. You know what the one promise we see in James 5 is? Look at James 5 verse 7. Notice the clause. Come on, we're rounding home. Notice the clause. It says, be patient. And this is the key word right here. Ready? Be patient. What? Until. Some of us think, man, it's just patience, 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 patience. We just need to keep waiting. Wait, 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 wait. And it says, be patient. Here's the clause. Until. There's an end. There is an end. There is an end. James 5, 7 says, until the Lord's coming. Look at verse 8. It says, be patient. The Lord's coming is near. Here's a clincher. Take a look at chapter 5, verse 11. It says, the Lord, for Job, finished it because he is full of compassion and mercy. Hey, you know the life of Job, and I'm done. Right? I'm finished. You know in the life of Job, Job lost all of his kids. He lost all of his wealth. He lost his reputation. He began to receive illness in his body, and his friends started giving him terrible advice. But in James chapter 5, verse 11, it says, You have heard of Job's patience, perseverance, and have seen what God finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Because you know why? Because when you get to Job chapter 42, God gives all of that back and more. All the kids, all the wealth, better reputation, and health. But that doesn't minimize the grief and the hurt he still has to carry from the former. And I'm not here to tell you that God is going to make your life nice and happy the moment you believe in him. Because that's not what the Bible says. But you know what the promise that you can hold on to in your patience is, and we'll put it up on the screen, is this. God will either, he's either going to replenish. Hey, if you're depleted, he's either going to replenish, he's either going to bring victory, and he's either going to refinish what he started. Meaning, in Philippians it says, the work that he began in you, he will bring back to completion in the coming of Christ Jesus. He's either going to replenish it, he's either going to bring victory in the area of your life that you're waiting on God for, or he's going to refinish it. But here's the deal. You know why it says and or? Because for some of you, and maybe for me, there's going to be areas in my life that God is not going to replenish. He is not going to bring victory in on this side of heaven, but he will refinish it. Until when the Lord comes. 
If you are a believer in Jesus, Romans 8, Romans 8, 28, the suffering and the groaning of the world is Good Friday. The pain in your life, the waiting you are enduring, the things that just don't make sense right now, that's Romans 8. You're waiting. That's Good Friday. You're waiting. But if you're a believer in Christ, you have the hope of the resurrection. You have the hope of the empty tomb. You have the hope of Revelation 21, that there is coming a time where there will be no more tears, no more pain, no more sickness, no more illness, no more frustration. But in the meanwhile, be a farmer. Work hard with a loving heart. Could we all rise together? I'm going to invite the team to come forward. I know that we do this from time to time, and hey, even if you're on the stream and you feel silly or goofy about it, being alone at your house watching this, I want you to join us, actually. So go ahead and, if you wouldn't mind, stand to your feet. Hey, what is the area in your life that you're waiting for God to, to break through for him to answer. You know, it might be something relational, it might be something emotional, it might be an illness, a financial thing. It even might be your spiritual walk with God. You feel like, man, it's been, and you have questions, good questions, healthy questions, and you just, I don't know about this whole Jesus person. What do I do with that? That's great. Can we just take the next 30 seconds as we sing this last song? Right, and we're going to sing that song that Carl taught you earlier up at the top, that he wins every battle. We're going to sing that. We're going to declare that in faith as a prayer to God. But before we do that, could we just come before God for 30 seconds between you and God? And maybe it's been a little bit. Maybe it's been a little bit of time since you've come before God in just honest transparency and say, God, I'm, I'm frustrated. Man, I'm, I'm really working through this. You got to help me. You got you to gotta help me. I need your help. Let's bring that before him, believing that he is full of compassion, that he is full of mercy. And there is no battle too big for him. Let's do that. All eyes closed, all heads bowed, and then we'll close with the song.
taking over my hysterical My walls are all crashing down Right now, I know you're able My God, come through again And you can do out Ephesians chapter 3. We're going to close out our service here. Ephesians 3, it says, For this reason I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives his name. And I pray that out of his glorious riches that he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide, how long, and how high and deep is the love of Christ. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, for an ever and ever. And God's people said, you have 168 hours. Would you go live every single one for Jesus? Thanks for being here.